Hello and welcome to day two of Geneva Trade Week and this session on the intersection of environment, COP26 and business. Joining me here today are two exceptional and high level speakers for what I hope will be a fairly informal fireside style discussion about the road to COP26 and how to make businesses heard and feel heard on that road. With no further ado, allow me to introduce our speakers for this morning. We have with us Executive Director pa Pamela Koch Hamilton of the International Trade Center here in Geneva. Welcome. And with us as well, we have Ambassador Simon Manley, the permanent representative of the United Kingdom to the WTO and in fact, all organizations in Geneva. Welcome to you as well. Just by way of context and introduction to our audience who are joining us from all over the world and who I would very much encourage to use the Q&A box at the bottom of their screens to, po uh, to pose questions to both of our panelists. Um, but just by way of context, I wonder if I could start with you, Executive Director. What is the International Trade Center's role and especially what is its connection to a more sustainable future? Okay, um, just quickly, the ITC was established in 1964 as a joint organization of the UN and the WTO. Wouldn't that's just me being, you know, pedantic. Um, what, <laughs> what it really is, is that we are an organization set up to help small businesses, MSMEs, um, and businesses across the board in developing countries to uh, work on the ground to implement uh, trade agreements to increase their business capacity to uh, to access markets uh, to improve market intelligence and more recently we've been working on the issue of voluntary sustainability standards and uh, the impact of climate change and, and changing rules in the climate context so that's it in a nutshell excellent um and I think that work is so critically important to everything we're going to talk about today. Um, Ambassador Manley, uh, I think people understand what the United Kingdom is, uh, but perhaps, <laughs> I would hope, uh, but perhaps uh, you could share with us a little bit of insight into the role of specifically the, the FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, um, and your own mission here in Geneva when it comes to the sustainability process. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me here. And uh, it's a real privilege to be here with uh, Pamela, who's such an inspiring uh, leader for us all uh, here in multilateral Geneva. So um, FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, we're quite young by comparison with the ITC. We're about a year old, just celebrated our birthday uh, this month. We're a merger of our traditional foreign office uh, and our development uh, ministry. Uh, DFID, which we're familiar to many of you kind of joining us this morning across the world. Uh, and we aim to bring together our foreign and the development expertise uh, here in Geneva as elsewhere across the world to show that actually you need to fuse that uh, action. And of course, nowhere more true than in these issues, uh, facing the climate crisis, but also ensuring that we can, through our trade policies and our development policies, actually make a real difference on the ground to people in the developing world. And I think that that on the ground point is really the key, the key point of resonance between between really both of you, because that's where the focus is at ITC, but it's also where the focus has to be in order to get results. Um, I should say before I get into my into my sort of more formal questions, that there's a really pleasing synergy to having the both of you here at Geneva Trade Week today. Because, of course, last year at our first Geneva Trade Week, uh, Executive Director, you were on our opening panel. And Ambassador, your predecessor spoke, uh, I think, at our closing panel. Um, so it, it is wonderful to come full circle and have you both join us today. And we really do appreciate all of the ongoing support from both of your organizations. Um, but we're not here, to, we're not here exclusively to, to praise Caesar. Um, though hopefully not to bury him either. Um, so let me begin with my, my first question, and I'll throw this one to you, Executive Director, if you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, I think at the moment, in terms of what we're hearing around the world, that there's, there's a song and music 
The song is that the calls for climate action, for environmental action, are growing louder constantly um, in the face of increased temperature growth, natural disasters. All of these things are leading to calls for action, and I think rightly so. Um, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that that song is happening against the backdrop of some pretty grim background music. Uh, there is, uh, COVID-19 is still ravaging most of the planet to one extent or another. Um, there is a downturn. There are increased shipping costs. There is global uncertainty. We're still six to one in Pickham, whether we're in a US-Chinese trade war on any given day. Your organization works directly on the ground with small medium enterprises. In a lot of ways, you're their voice in the international system. What are you and your staff hearing on the ground in terms of the anxieties businesses have about the responses to climate change and environmental challenges and pollution? What are they concerned about? Um, thanks so much, Dimitri. Um, first of all, let me just uh, thank Ambassador Manley and the Geneva Trade Platform for the opportunity to share with you this morning on this really important topic. Um, let me start by saying some of the key anxieties that we're seeing when businesses are adapting to respond to climate change are, first of all, ensuring compliance with the private requirements, the voluntary sustainability standards, and also with the emerging regulations, and of course, having the financial, technological, and human capital resources to make the adjustments. I think it's important that we can try to focus on our attention on developing the kind of good business or good trade, that's the spirit of ITC's Green to Compete strategy. So let me give you a little bit. Our Green to Compete initiative supports the small businesses to overcome the challenges in the green transition and also to turn these challenges into opportunities. How? By raising awareness with MSMEs on the importance of improving their reputation by going green, which helps them access international value chains more easily. We also do this by trying to facilitate access to financing and also by advising MSMEs on the sectors in which they're well placed to compete, the solutions to build their climate resilience, and also the solutions to increase their efficiency. So some of the examples of work we've done, for example, in the sustainable finance area, through the Green to Compete Hub in Kenya, ITC has supported Mionga which is a Kenyan startup in the dried mango business to access 300,000 US dollars in order to purchase a solar drying truck. The second in the area of market connections through a green to compete hub in Peru. We're working with a company called Shiwi, which is a local woman owned company producing sustainable sourced food ingredients from the Amazon. And ITC is supporting them to sell their products online and to reach consumers who place emphasis on sustainable produced products. And then in the area of higher efficiency, ITC is working with the Vietnamese clothing producer, Sancom, to increase productivity and to save resources like water and energy during the production process. I think key to all of this for many of the small businesses, Dimitri, is the fact that they, it's fear. Fear that they won't be able to function effectively, fear that they won't be able to be competitive. And what we're trying to show them is how they can actually navigate this process and engage more fully in, in, in the greening of trade. Thank you, Executive Director. And I think that that sort of theme of fear is really interesting to hear from the ground. Uh, and I think all of those examples that you brought up where ITC has sort of stepped into the breach it, I mean, it's exemplary in its own right, but I think it also demonstrates the scale of the problem. And, and on that, I sort of want to turn to you, Ambassador. Uh, I, know, I know you are personally very focused on the so-called MSME agenda here in Geneva, micro, small, medium enterprises, and what the system can do for them. Um, so you, you probably a lot of what the executive director heard would be fairly familiar concerns to you. Um, not just in terms of how businesses will survive, but how they will make their voices heard in the negotiating rooms that will determine the playing field. Um, so I, I guess my question to you would be, how is the, the UK FCDO as the host of COP26 seeking to ensure that smaller businesses not only are heard, but also that they feel heard to alleviate some of these anxieties? 
Uh, look, I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and uh, let me just pay tribute again to kind of uh, some of the activity that Pamela has just described there in terms of what the ITC is doing in this field. And, and I think I mean, she's got to put a real kind of uh, summed up very well in terms of kind of turning challenge into opportunity. Um, you know, this, this greening of the global economy can appear daunting, I think, to many uh, medium small businesses, and particularly to micro businesses. How, how do we play our part? And is it going to sort of, does it pose a threat to us? And I think, you know, our, our message is, uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, you, you know, it, it offers you real opportunities if you can embrace it. And look, it's absolutely essential that those businesses do embrace it. You know, in the UK, we have 6 million uh, small businesses. It's 99% of our businesses, uh, uh, over half of all those employed in the UK. So unless those businesses are part of this process of greening our economy, greening the global economy, you know, we simply will not be able to achieve what we want to achieve. And look, we've, we have grand ambitions for COP26. But absolutely right, because just look at what we have faced over the course of this, just these last few months in terms of seeing the practical effects of the climate crisis on communities across the globe. You know, this is a vital and pressing uh, issue, and we need to take action now. But what can we do? Well, we can do things like today. First of all, which is listening to, engaging with business. Uh, and, you know, I think for me, it's fundamental that both in the WTO, but also ITC and UNCTAD, that we listen more to business, learn from business, and enable business to take part in this greening of the global economy. As governments, of course, we can do even more to enable that process, as we're trying to do uh, through uh, lowering tariffs, for example, through our own uh, uh, measures, uh, on some of the kind of the most critical environmental goods in the areas of the renewable energy and the rest. We can produce, we can shift export finance as we're doing to support low carbon projects. And we can ensure that we're working day in, day out to attract investment in those areas that is going to enable us to green the economy like renewable energy uh, and like um, you know, electric vehicles. So government can play a role, but it can only play a role if it's in collaboration with business and particularly those smallest uh, of our firms. Thank you, Ambassador. And I, and I would like to sort of dive a little bit more into the UK's own Green Industrial Revolution plan and, and how that fits into this picture. But before I do, and not at all meaning to, to start a fight, um, exec, uh, Executive Director, I mean, you just, you just heard uh, the Ambassador outline some of the steps and some of the messages, um, you know, collaboration with business is always the, the watchword of government. It's a, it's a common refrain. Um, what are the messages that you think the small businesses that you're talking to need to hear coming out of COP26 and indeed out of all of these high offices of state in order to feel uh, in order for that fear to be mitigated, the fear you were describing before, is this enough? Should more be said? Is something missing? Um, yes, I think you are trying to start a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the key messages I'd like to put out there to our constituents is that the issue of cost in going green can be prohibitive which makes it essential that they receive the support of government and the BSOs to help them make the transition. Many of the small businesses, especially those in developing countries, can't afford to go green, even if they say it's a priority. And this is one of the challenges. We find that small firms in developing countries are among the most concerned about climate change. You know, 68% of the companies in Sub-Saharan Africa say that environmental risks are significant to their business. But just 38% of small firms have actually invested in adapting to environmental risks compared to the 60% of large firms. And so what we found is that, you know, also many small businesses simply lack the information and resources to go green, which means that governments need to incentivize going green. And I'm very excited to hear what I must say about the kinds of, of you know, reduction in tariffs and, and you know, uh, barriers to going green. 
Um, so the green friendly policies that we think should be implemented should include financing green infrastructure, providing energy efficient retrofit subsidies, investing in sustainable agriculture, making access to concessional loans or recovery programs conditional on commitments to cut greenhouse gases when appropriate, and subsidizing SME access to clean or renewable energies. For example, as my minister, Kamina Johnson-Smith of Jamaica has shared with us, Jamaica adopted new legislation to enhance financing for MSMEs. And policymakers are also working to facilitate investment in emerging climate resilient goods and services, as well as mechanisms to encourage the MSMEs to pursue climate adaptation strategies. It's also crucial for us, you know, to help developing countries to sit at the table at multilateral discussions on how trade can contribute to environmental sustainability, such as in the lead up to MC12 and COP. I think it's important to support developing countries to engage in these kinds of processes and give their voice and their priorities for trade and the environment agenda. So we really think that policy from government will certainly undergo green change and it's crucial that the perspectives of developing countries are taken on board. So in short, there has to be a whole of economy approach to prioritize the green recovery, even above immediate economic benefits. I think it's important at this stage to also say that, you know, perhaps one of the elements that we could pursue is looking at a trade issues um, kind of uh, small group in the context of COP26 so that we can actually begin to bring these kinds of issues to the table in an environmental setting where the two tend to run parallel instead of together. So there was there was a lot there, but I think that the fundamental the fundamental message about whole of government and whole of economy approach is really kind of the key message, as well as that inclusion of developing country voices and small and medium and micro business voices. Though of course that latter half relies so much on organizations like ITC, because if you are running a micro business. In, in any country, uh, you simply do not have time in a lot of cases to attend 22 hour meetings about where commas should go in a non-binding statement. Um, we're not that bad, Dimitri, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes I think we're worse, but uh, I might have soft sold it a bit there. But it's certainly, the process is certainly far too heavy for any small business owner to get as invested in. So they do rely on, on organizations like ITC to be their voice. Um, but uh, I think I wanna come back to some of the government measures that you were talking about, um, and especially the messaging around those and come back to you, um, uh, Ambassador. The United Kingdom recently released its 10 point plan for the green industrial revolution. And I think reading through that, even just the tone is as the executive director was alluding to it's overwhelmingly opportunities led that was mm -hmm. this is an opportunity for us to remake the economy to 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 create jobs and progress um do you think uh, obviously the united kingdom feels like that's the right message for the united kingdom um do you think that kind of opportunities led messaging is the way to go all over the world to get cop 26 across the line um, do you think that's the kind of message that will resonate here in Geneva with delegations? And, and frankly, is it one that will land on factory floors and in offices and in fields all over the world? Look, I think I think we have to I think we have to change the narrative to one that uh, underscores the opportunities here. That we all I think we all recognise, and, and Pamela's kind of rightly alluded to the. You know, the real life challenge that the companies, you know, whether in sub-Saharan Africa and small island states are already facing from the, the, the effects of climate change right here and right now. This isn't something that's going to happen in 15 or 20 years. It's happening now to so many communities uh, across the world. But I think it is important for governments to uh, identify opportunities, uh, to give people hope uh, that we can embrace this green transition. And let me just kind of endorse what Pamela was saying about the holistic approach. That's exactly, Dimitri, as you said, that's what's in our own government's uh, plan. Uh, and also the critical role that trade can play here. 
Um, our own uh, Board of Trade released a report just before the summer uh, on green trade, which kind of identifies ways in which we can green uh, the global economy through greening trade policy. And the government says kind of some of these discussions have hitherto been a bit sort of uh, in their own silos. We've been discussing kind of climate change in, in uh, uh, climate uh, fora, we've been discussing development and development fora and trade and trade fora. We really now need to bring these discussions together on the back of uh, what we hope will be an ambitious outcome to COP26 to take this work forward. And look, every government across the world, every international organisation can and must play its part in this. Uh, for our part, uh, you mentioned our 10-point plan, uh, we're also, I think fundamentally, uh, to pick up kind of Pamela's point about finance here, trying to shift the character of finance for business. Uh, we have our own kind of British Business Bank, sort of, which is a sort of national development bank, if you like, uh, which we are trying to shift across in terms of its own focus, its own objectives towards the transition to net zero. But we're also looking to the private sector, to commercial finance, to do the same, to understand the needs of its clients, small, medium, micro, and bigger firms, uh, to enable their own transition, uh, so as to seize these opportunities uh, that the green transition will offer, while acknowledging the kind of the anxiety, genuine anxiety, that many people, as you say, Dimitri, will feel about how this is going to affect them. But we have to give people a positive narrative about the way forward. On that note of positive narrative, uh, I wanted to come back to you, Executive Director, um, just because of, of a sort of resonance I felt when I was reading the, the latest SME competitive out, competitiveness outlook from, from ITC, which I think we can share in the chat if we haven't done so already, which is kind of ITC's, I suppose, flagship annual report. And this time you focused very, very strongly on sustainability and environmental sustainability. Um, and getting to the recommendations, what I suppose surprised me or struck me as slightly counterintuitive is that you made a very strong business case for green transition as a medium to long-term cost saver and profit maximization effort um and, and i have to say i think like on a on a very in a very simplistic way that struck me as surprising because the assumption is if you take everything at face value that going green means more costs not just in terms of transitioning but the reason we do things in a dirty way in a polluting way is because that is the path of least resistance um, you know, if solar had been cheaper than coal for the last 200 years, we would have no coal power plants. Um, but it's been considerably cheaper. It is cheaper to dump waste into a river than it is to properly dispose of it. That is the narrative around going green. It is pain you have to bear, either in a, in a moral sense or because governments will force you to do so for, through regulation. And that's why I think some of the report, some of the recommendations and some of the, um, I suppose, arguments in the report were surprising. And I wonder if you could talk through some of the recommendations, some of what comes out of that report that run against this, this, this grain. Um, thanks so much, Dimitri. Um, you know what? Yes, things are complicated. You know, dirtier practices would be cheaper in the short term. And I'll, I'll mention something I learned uh, years ago, and I, I still remember it because it was so perfect. It said, there's a difference between hurt versus harm. And it alluded to when you have a, a toothache and you need to remove the tooth. It hurts. But if you leave the tooth in and it continues to, to you know, uh, rot or decay, the long-term impact on the overall body is harm. And I think that's where we need to get to, you know? It is true that some green interventions won't make sense for everyone, and the exact climate risks for a given place are not precisely known, so it's hard to plan ahead. And access to finance, of course, remains a challenge for small firms. Um, 
And of course, there's also a lack of domestic demand for the green transition in some developing countries. But the point is that if we don't do it, let us look at the long-term impact that we're, well, frankly, what we're already seeing from coal, what the impact has been overall on the climate and therefore on people. Um, let's look at whether small businesses will actually be able to function effectively in another 50 years based on how climate change is occurring. So if we don't do what we need to do now, the cost will be much higher in the long term. And so the business case that we have tried to make is simply this. One, it increases your resilience. It increases small businesses' resilience in a time of even COVID so that they can rely on, well, let's look at the fuel situation in the UK, but maybe I should, <laughs> I should have mentioned that. Okay, let's move along. Okay, and it has, it looks at cost reductions and higher productivity. Um, we can give you examples of where, you know, businesses in, the, in developing countries that have gone solar, that have gone to wind energy, have lowered their production costs extraordinarily and increased their productivity. It also allows them to be compliant with climate regulations and increase their access to markets because more and more consumers and lead firms are demanding that they meet certain standards in order to get access to the markets. And then also it gives them more eligibility for green financing. And there's a lot of green financing out there. You know? So there are green investments that are appropriate and profitable for both people and planet. And in going green, the SMEs will need assistance to select those locally appropriate investments. Um, they can choose nature-based solutions that help both climate and local ecosystems while improving resilience. Um, for example, farming using local biodiverse seed variants that are resistant to drought. And for those investments that are not yet profitable or that require too long of a return, this is where the support from actors in the business ecosystem is needed the most. And looking at the big picture, however, going green is worth the effort. Nearly 60% of the African companies that we interviewed who had invested in green measures said they generated um, long-term benefits. Um, you know, the firms that made green investment, almost 20% increased their product quality, 17% accessed new markets, 17% increased production, and 10% reduced their input costs, and 7% made new products. So it also helps with innovation. And so what we're saying is that small businesses need the support to do this. And that's why we have the 20-point green recovery plan um, outlining the actions for BSOs, governments, lead firms, and international organizations to help make SMEs become more resilient and competitive. So, you know, we can go into more detail, but I don't want to, you know, take more time. But these are the kinds of things that we think would be important in the context of businesses going green, small and medium-sized enterprises. Thank you, Executive Director. I, it's really interesting to hear that almost two-sided story. Yes. Because, because, I, because I have to say, you know, when, when, you, when you began your answer to that question and you were talking, I think the, the tooth removal uh, analogy is visceral. Thank you for that. Um, but, uh, uh, but also, I think it, it does speak to this kind of moral and planet-wide case. But as you were saying that, I, was, I couldn't help but think if I was a small business in a developing country that is currently ravaged by COVID and the sort of buffeted by the global economy, mm -hmm. and someone was turning to me and sort of making this case that I should take on short to medium term pain in order to avoid the climate change itself, I think the, the the temptation for me to say was this is, you know, I will just, I don't have the capacity to do this, to take on this pain in order for this global cosmic good that may not materialize if others don't do the same. Um, so there is, you know, while there is a strong moral case, I thought the second half of your the second half of your response, which spoke directly to the fact that, hey, that you're not doing this just to save the polar bears or even to prevent long-term damage to your own business 15 years from now, which is a very long time indeed, there's actually direct commercial benefits. This is a reinvestment you can make in your own business to be stronger. And I think we do need both sides of that equation. I don't want to belittle the moral case, but I think that second half was, uh, was really kind of poignant and, and impactful to a lot of businesses. I think it's 
uh, it's great to hear you make that case. Um, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, uh, Ambassador, with something of a, a I guess, a, a challenging question born of born of all of my my cynicism. Um, I think in the which, as you can tell, uh, I think when we whenever we bring anything like this to the WTO or into trade policy, the hard edges of trade policy, regulations, tariffs. I think the perhaps justifiable concern from a lot of not just developing countries, but really um, all WTO members is, is this real or is this protectionism dressed in green? Or is this, you know, are, are you really trying to protect the seals or are you simply trying to give your fishermen a leg up over someone else's? Um, the United Kingdom has recently taken up its own truly individual voice at the WTO. I imagine you are hearing some of these concerns overtly or less so from your colleagues, depending on their levels of diplomacy. Um, what, what, do, what, do, uh, what do you say to, to those who are concerned that this will be hijacked by big business to entrench existing inequality? Uh, well, thank you, Dimitri. And look, I mean, first of all, don't don't knock the polar bears and the seals. Yeah? Uh, and uh, well, I'm I'm still recovering from Pamela's dental um, analogy, but um, uh, look, uh, yeah, of course there are those concerns. Of course, we, you kind of occasionally face those accusations, even from my extraordinarily polished diplomatic colleagues in the WTO. Uh, but look, I don't think any of us, any of us, can deny the scale and the ferocity of the climate crisis that we're facing right now. You know, the, what we have seen just, as I said, just over these last few months, surely, surely with the, the temperatures that we've seen, the floods, the storms, it's happening. It's happening right now. And you know, the countries that are most vulnerable to this, but we are all vulnerable. We all face existential challenges to the way that we have uh, our economies have worked for the last 200 years, but the most vulnerable are some of the poorest uh, nations on earth. Um, they are the small island states. They are uh, at least developing economies whose economies stand to be ravaged by the effects of climate change. Uh, so we have to seize these issues. You know, and uh, yeah, I'm passionate about this in the WTO. Uh, this is not some kind of issue that we can kind of uh, push off to some work program that's going to kind of report in 20 years time uh, or we can't have another we can't have another fisheries subsidies negotiation that takes 20 years we need action now and we need to fundamentally kind of rethink the time scales with which we work on, on these issues uh, if trade is going to solution to what is an existential crisis uh, for all of us but for particularly acute for those most vulnerable countries. Um, you know, uh, Boris Johnson said at the UN General Assembly uh, a couple of days ago that COP26 represents a sort of collective coming of age. Yeah, it's, uh, and that we have to show that we have the maturity and, and wisdom to act. Uh, and I think that's as true in the WTO as it is uh, in the UN. Now is the time. Now it's the moment. You have to act. Uh, I mean, that th that certainly resonates with me, and I hope that message is is resonating around the world. I hope it resonated uh, at the General Assembly. Um, I, I will I will make you uh, a deal, Ambassador. I will not knock polar bears and seals if you don't knock work program, working parties that take 20 years to report, uh, which, which are my precious endangered species. Um, but actually, I, I did want to just kind of dive into this, and we do have questions starting to come in, which I'll turn to in a moment after just a, a, a little bit more hassling you myself. Um, uh, I thought listening to some of the examples that the executive director was, uh, was going through in terms of businesses that have made a green transition and that were sort of delivering green outcomes, what struck me was that nothing on the list are what you traditionally think of when you hear when you hear green transition. So she wasn't talking about a solar panel factory. She wasn't talking about wind 
turbine manufacturer. And I think that does sometimes get lost in the debate, doesn't it? Whenever you hear even, you know, you listen to, to President Biden talk about what a green revolution means for, for the US, a lot of it is through this lens of rebuilding big factory jobs, mega factories making big complex machinery. Um, and I can imagine that developing countries listening to that are saying, well, hold on, some of us will get a slice of that pie, but we can't all simultaneously be exporters of solar panels. Someone will have to import this. So I, I guess I would put this to both of you. I don't know which one of you wants to, to have a go at this, but how do we broaden the conversation to broaden people's imagination about what a green trans position can include to to go beyond these sort of iconic iconic things and, and while you do so i do urge people to drop their questions into q a um so that so that i can leave these nice people alone and they can deal with they can deal with your questions instead simon do you want to go ahead yeah well i mean i, just thought I was like dimitri i was tremendously kind of impressed by those statistics that you kind of had there, Pamela. And I think, you know, I think, you know, we have a, a shared responsibility to tell those stories and to tell them more effectively. Uh, because actually, the practical stories of uh, how businesses, smallest businesses, in particularly in the developed world, are uh, making that transition is infinitely more powerful than the voices of governments and diplomats, to be honest. You know, when we, it's a sort of slightly similar example, but when we try and persuade companies to export, uh, and you know, it's a struggle, right? Uh, it's easy to be con you know, con contained and content with your domestic market. But we all know that companies that export more are more productive and more successful. Uh, and, you know, we can say that until the cows come home. Uh, but actually, what resonates are the stories of the firms that have done that, it's particularly the smallest firms, to show that, yeah, you can do it. You can make that difference. Um, and I think that's what we need to do with the green transition and the sort of examples that Pamela cited. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say, Dimitri, that, you know, just to go back to something um, the ambassador said earlier in his presentation, um, that we have to pull together the strings of trade development and climate change in one group. I think that is what is going to be one of the significant changes in how we approach this issue. Because if businesses don't talk to the climate people and the climate people don't talk to trade and trade doesn't talk to development, we will never get a coherent you know, structure that addresses the concerns of everyone and that everyone can also feel that they've been heard. And I think this is one of the major weaknesses and, and perhaps, you know, COP26 could be an opportunity uh, for us to try to pull together, you know, even a small group of the coalition of the willing, let's put it that way, who could discuss this, who could look at these are the business issues that are gonna affect small countries or, or as you say, the countries on the front line ambassador. Um, these are the development issues that are of concern in this green transition. You know, 30 years ago when we were discussing intellectual property rights and I was here in Geneva, you know, in Uruguay around, it was as much of a challenge then for us to see value in that. 30 years later, it's obvious to everybody, you know, what, how much Bob Marley has been able to earn since he's died. I mean, you know, let's be realistic. So we have been able now to take advantage of a transition that was being negotiated 30 years ago and which scared many countries. But I think this is where it's important to begin to have that dialogue with the relevant people present. So I'll just stop there. I think it's, I think it's fascinating how much what you've just, what you've just called for this kind of bringing together into one room, how much that echoes what the WTO Director General and your your deputy, uh, Dorothy Tembo, said yesterday on a completely different subject at our opening mm -hmm. plenary on trade for peace, where the message was exactly the same, that we have lots of different actors with lots of different pieces of the same trade adjacent puzzle. 
and we have to get them into into the same room. And I guess the the challenge to you, Ambassador, and to, to the United Kingdom ahead of COP26 is what does that room look like? How do you make that room feel real rather than simply tokenistic? Um, I want to give you a chance to respond to that, but I realize it's a, it's a huge question. Well, no, look, uh, but it's an absolutely fair question, and I agree entirely with everything that uh, Pamela said, and I was being despite being sort of slightly diverted back to an image of being on a beach in Jamaica listening to Bob Marley. But uh, look, we have to break the silos down, right? Here in Geneva and in Glasgow. Uh, and we're, you know, we are trying, and it's, yeah, it's a challenge, right? For obvious reasons of COVID pandemic, how many people we can get into to venues. But we are trying in Glasgow to be as inclusive as we can in terms of bringing the bringing these debates home and doing so in a holistic manner that, as Pamela said, kind of, you know, gets out of these natural divides. And, you know, it is very true that in this city, you know, like all multilateral cities, you can, you can have your debate within your individual organization. But in what strikes me is when you look at these issues, and the same, by the way, true of issues around vaccine equity uh, as here, greening trade, you know, there is not one international organization that is capable of delivering uh, this change. We can only deliver this change if we work together across the boundaries and find ways in which we can create fora that are collaborative fora, genuinely collaborative fora, between developed and, de uh, and developing countries, between organizations, and between organizations, governments, and business and civil society. We need a different way of working uh, that is actually going to prepare us to make this change successfully. I think that that mention of collaborative fora actually brings us really nicely to the first of our audience questions, which as a reminder, you can just drop straight into uh, Q&A. Um, so yeah, uh, the question was, I think that this will go for both of you, but I think we'll start with you, Ambassador, just to stay with you, is what do you see the role of the WTO in make in the debate around making trade greener, I think the WTO has to be part of the solution. You know, uh, it has it does do has had conversations about the environment and trade already, but we have to bring those much more to the centre of the WTO's work. Uh, these the greening of the global economy is going to bring <laughs> trade issues to the fore, whether we like it or not. We can't. It's, we, we can't avoid that. We're already seeing those issues come up. The question is, can we embrace that? And can we see the WTO as a kind of as a positive force for here, here, looking at ways in which trade policy, broadly read, and in collaboration with the ITC and others, uh, can make a difference and can enable companies, micro, small, medium, and big, to make this transition and to enable us to avoid the worst scenarios uh, from climate change? Um, I think, Dimitri, you know, it's a it's a critical question. There's no, there's no, I think there's nobody who will oppose or have any um, reticence about the fact that the WTO must be part of the discussion. And the fact is there are going to be rules because those rules will then begin to determine how the green transition takes place in a trade context legally. The problem is that we have seen already, once again, we go back to the fear factor. Many developing countries already see what the implications of, say, a carbon border adjustment might be. And how are they going to make that transition? How are they going to meet the requirements of the new rules? You know, How are they going to address the non-tariff barriers that will arise or may be utilized? You know, so, in a sense, this is where, as, as Amasta said, the, the collaborative nature of what we do is so critical. So WTO will make the rules. ITC um, and presumably UNCTAD will have to work with the developing countries to enable them to make that kind of transition, to put in place the mechanisms at the local level um, to, to, you know, to meet and take advantage of the opportunities presented. So. I think I mean I think that that's a that's a good that's a good answer for what the WTO can can do in terms of its 
it's messaging and it's positioning. Um, and I and I thank you both. We've got we've got some more questions coming in, and I'll just kind of throw them out to the to the room with slight extemporizing in in some places. Um, we we have a question about what kind of support is the WGO planning for Africa as part of the post COVID recovery. But I, I I wanted to perhaps, given that we have spoken about I suppose the negotiating function, the convening function. Um, ITC is, of course, a, a, WTO, a WTO agency in part, and Ambassador Manley, the United Kingdom, is a supporter of, I believe, the, the Enhanced Integrated Framework within the WTO, but also the standards, the STDF, um, the, the TFAF, all of these aid for trade bodies within the WTO house. So I wonder if both of you could speak just, just briefly about what are the kind of practical on the ground things that are planned for um, Africa's post-COVID recovery. Um, and I might start with you, Ambassador, just because Pamela's, we've just hassled Pamela. <laughs> I'd, I'd also just um, <laughs> cite the support we offer to kind of Commonwealth small states to kind of engage in the negotiating process here in Geneva, because uh, Pamela rightly kind of referred to it earlier. And it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah? I find it quite a challenge to kind of be in several places at one and the same uh, time. Uh, so, and I'm fortunate. I mean, a kind of reasonably large mission here, and it's it's so much harder for some of the smallest countries to participate, and we need to enable them to participate. Um, I wouldn't kind of, I wouldn't sort of talk of an Africa-specific response, if I may, because I think you know we need to look at this holistically, uh, and you know, look, we we are still going through, as you said, uh, Dimitri, at the start. You know, we are not through this pandemic. For lots of the world, this is absolutely the lived reality. I've sat here in Geneva, it's kind of easy to forget quite how overwhelming the pandemic continues to be for most people in the world. Uh, and you know, it is particularly acute in Africa, clearly, uh, because we have not been able to deliver the scale of vaccines uh, that Africa needs. That's kind of one of the big challenges. And that's a, that is a particular role, I have to say again, for the WTO, again, in collaboration. Now, you know, let me kind of, you know, praise the work of Dr. Ngozi here in kind of working with Dr. Tedros at WHO and Darren Tang at WIPO to kind of to forge a really collaborative response between the international organizations and with the private sector uh, to help scale up uh, production, uh, uh, distribution, and delivery of vaccines globally, because that has to be right at the forefront uh, of enabling uh, Africa's recovery uh, from this pandemic and to enable us to build that better. But then, yes, it is about looking to the future and seeing how we can help enable a more a greener, more sustainable recovery from this pandemic, that has to include the greening of our uh, global trade policies. Uh, it has to include looking at tough issues around agriculture as well. Uh, but in doing so in a way that is sustainable, and kind of you mentioned earlier, which you kind of, you know, uh, our own sort of emergence as, um, as an independent member of the WTO uh, just this year, uh, you know, part of that process has been for us uh, now outside the European Union to rethink our own agriculture policies as a nation. And to do so in a way that kind of forges what we hope will be a more sustainable path, a greener path uh, for our agricultural sector, but also for our rural communities. And that I think these are challenges that we recognize you know, governments are facing around the world. Sorry, I was off. Um, from my part, Dimitri, I think when we have worked in over 50 countries in Africa over the last few years, and we actually just launched a One Trade Africa program um, in uh, November or December of last year. And the primary, the primary reason for that is to see how we could actually take the AFCFTA as a fundamental basis for our interventions across the board. Because in the final analysis, I think the AFCFTA can be the single most transformational um, and, you know, agreement uh, worldwide and also for Africa as a continent. And so what we want to do is to ensure that any kind of interventions that we do also are, are, are collaborating in achieving that vision of the heads of, of, of state of Africa. Um, so we're working at several levels. We work in, in the digital space. 
we're trying to work on getting more MSMEs connected because without connection, as we've seen over the last 18 months, it is going to be extremely difficult for MSMEs mm -hmm. to be competitive. The second issue is we work, of course, in gender. We work with women entrepreneurs. We have the She Trades program. Um, we're present across the entire uh, landscape of Africa. We have several She Trades hubs. And we're working to see how we can continue to build the capacity of women to trade. Um, final thing, of course, is the Green to Compete. We're working um, through helping them um, engage in greening uh, their transition models, particularly post-COVID, and how they can become more competitive. We, of course, have the market intelligence tools, which is one of our flagship um, areas as well, um, and the standards map, which has been it's now 10 years, and it has over 300 standards listed. And we try to help them meet the standards for particular markets. So we have a, a broad, a broad um, approach to, to uh, ensuring that we try to work with Africa um, in implementing and, and, and um, engaging in international trade. Uh, I think you're muted. Uh, now, I, now I've done it. Um, it's contagious. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to you both. Um, I think just on, on the tools uh, that ITC has developed, um, I, I don't know about any, anyone else, but I think I, I am responsible for about half the hits on Mac map on any given day, just because it is absolutely life-saving to anyone trying to be informed about trade. So I can hardly recommend them. Uh, yeah. We have a, a question that's come through from Carol, from Dr. Carolyn Deer Burbeck in the, in the chat, um, which is for me as the moderator of an environment session is a bit like having Yo-Yo Ma lift his hand up while you're playing cello on stage. Uh, and I'm going to be even more brazen and slightly re phrase that question because I think Ambassador, you've actually dealt with it already. The question was about what, because um, you've both mentioned the need for stronger multilateral cooperation on trade, environment, sustainable development, including at the WTO. And she was asking, can you tell us what the UK and the ITC do in international Geneva to support developing countries to engage in and be leaders in a discussion on of a green trade agenda and what would support their businesses and communities. Now, Ambassador, you've already spoken about uh, your work, the UK's work with the small states office and getting them into these rooms. So I want to reframe this question ever so slightly and throw it to you, executive director. Um, you know, we, we've, we've all spoken about ITC's role as a voice for small business in these rooms. So perhaps a rather challenging question then, again, to start a small fight. Are you, do you feel like uh, ITC is invited into the room enough to be that voice? And are there ways that um, the delegations here, the WTO, can bring a bigger voice for business, both through ITC, but perhaps through UNCTAD, through the WEF, through others, uh, and the businesses themselves? Um, <laughs> I take the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's put it this way. I, I think that we have been included in a lot of the discussions as they have developed. And I think we have to be fair in the sense that the, the way the WTO is structured, um, it's a member state driven organization. And therefore, member states are the ones who have to determine who gets to be included, who gets to engage, and how that engagement takes place. And having been a former delegate myself, I know the sensitivities around that. And so for me, we've already been uh, included now in an informal working group on gender, which was just launched last year. Um, we do attend some of the meetings of the MSME working group, but we'd like to probably uh, engage more, given the fact that that is now a standing uh, working group. We believe that uh, more can be done in terms of our engagement in the environmental context, but we have been working with the WTO Secretariat on that. Um, I mean, if we had our way, we'd be invited to everything. But the point is, the point is, it is a it is a member state driven organization, and therefore, you know, the member states have to feel that it is in their uh, long-term interest to have ITC at the table in certain respects. And we are open and willing uh, to have ITC present where they feel it is it is necessary and, and help. Is that a nice diplomatic answer, Ambassador? <laughs> uh, I'm going to give you a less diplomatic answer, Dimitri. Uh, 
this this member driven organization of course it's true uh, but it's a mantra which i have to say i find occasionally drives me a little bit mad um i'd love to see more of pamela and her team at the wto look uh, i think we the members or well, uh, are too skeptical of the utility of the WTO Secretariat, but also collaboration. If we are going to address these sorts of issues successfully, we need to do so, as we've discussed earlier, in a more collaborative way. Uh, we need to make better use of the expertise uh, and knowledge of the WTO Secretariat, of partner organizations like ITC, uh, of business, civil society, we have to forge new ways of working. And I think that again, coming back to my point about vaccine equity, what, what has most impressed me about the fora uh, which Dr. Ngozi has sort of uh, established on these issues is the manner, it's the manner in which uh, she has worked uh, with others across the uh, international organizations and private sector and civil society. Uh, We've just got to, you know, we, we can't just work in the way that we've always worked because it's not delivering the nature, the, the sort of the character of the responses that we need to tackle these challenges. I, I think that's, that's as comprehensive answer as we could hope for, I think, uh, on these issues. There are always going to be institutional limits um, to what the WTO can do, but it can do, do better. And sort of, I, I thank you both for, for your candor. Uh, as I as I ambush you with these uh, outside of the protections of the US Constitution and its amendments. Um, so I wanted to we've got just a few a few minutes to go and I want to throw a very quick question to you ambassador that's come in uh, from the chat from uh, Abu Saleh who asks without settling broader development issues in the WTO questions about special and differential treatment I'm assuming they're alluding to which uh, I think it's it's reasonable to say likely won't be conclusively resolved before MC12. But even given that, is there any hope, do you see any hope for a consensus on green issues heading into MC12 and beyond? Yes, I do. And look, I mean, there's, there's a danger, I think, to be honest, in the WTO of kind of saying, well, unless we can uh, agree on X, Y, and Z, you, know, you can't do A, B, and C. You know? Uh, there are a whole series of really pressing, important issues before the WTO. Uh, dispute settlement, which we haven't touched on today. We, we do need to have a functioning dispute settlement mechanism. We don't currently have it. We do need uh, to address the issues around S and DT uh, and find a solution that is fit for purpose for the global economy of 2021. Uh, we do need to address issues around market distorting practices and industrial subsidies. Uh, these are all important issues. We do need to, to address issues around agriculture, but we cannot and must not allow the best to be the enemy of the good. And nowhere is that more true, I think, than in, uh, on the green agenda. I think I am reasonably hopeful that the members of this organization will recognize the scale of the challenge uh, on climate, and recognize that the WTO has to play a role. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. But I don't think anybody wants that. We want to find multilateral solutions to these issues, including on trade. And we need to find multilateral solutions to these issues. We need to work out how trade, how trade for development can underpin this greening of the global economy. So, yes, I'm hopeful. It's thank you so much. And I think it's it's a rare pleasure to be able to finish a panel on the WTO trade and environment on a genuinely hopeful and not morose note. Uh, so thank you very much for taking us home, Ambassador. Thank you so much, Executive Director, for joining us. This was uh, an honor and privilege and a pleasure. Thank you to you both and your organizations for the support of Geneva Trade Week. Thank you to the technical team. That means I get to just talk uh, uh, while they make all of the magic happen. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. I hope you all check out the rest of Geneva Trade Week and of course the public forum. Hope you join us in our virtual convention hall and you join us for the student watch party of the WTO public forum opening plenary at uh, 12.30 CET today. 
So again, thank you so much for joining us and I'll see you next time, I suppose. Bye. Thank, thank you, you Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela.